normally I keep most of the dye plants in pots around here. The reason that they're not there today is because we've had a really big wind up here in Shetland and it would have just destroyed them. But if you come around the corner here, this is one of the dye plants that is grown from seed and it's indigo, um, which gives the most beautiful blue and permanent blue. It lasts and lasts and you can do tie dyeing and all sorts of things. With the wool, I dye wool blue with woad or indigo um, and then I over dye it so that I use marigold which gives a yellow because I love the greens that you can get with plants like marigold and indigo together. The indigo needs watering every day unless it's pouring with rain so I'll just give it a wee little bit. There we go. Maybe the marigold too in case it's feeling left out. One of the things that I learned really quickly is that protecting things from the wind was like massively important. So I dug this bed lower and lower to try and have it a bit wind protected because this faces west and a lot of the prevailing winds come from the west. So you've got this kind of bank um, and it wasn't then protected so well from the northwest, but it is now because of the bushes and the trees growing. So from here going down, um, I think this is probably mm, maybe 15 years old, this part of the dye garden, so it's slightly newer. Um, and so this bed here, I dug deeper and deeper to try and protect the plants that are in that. And then as I dug that one, I was thinking, this isn't going to work if the winds come from that way. So I've built these funny little stone wood um, earth walls because they help channel the wind and they help protect the plants. They are built out of the soil and rocks that came out of the ground when I dug these beds. Um, some of the rocks like these ones were buried and they were very difficult to get out, it was quite funny. If you come around this way, I'll show you something about how the garden's fertilised. Uh, I don't like using anything chemical in the garden at all. So I've had to use things that I have myself in the garden. Now this is comfrey and comfrey leaves, particularly these big ones at the bottom that are going tatty, you pick them off and you can put them in water and leave them to soak for a couple of weeks or more. It gets very stinky and not a very nice smell, but it creates a liquid fertilizer. So you just add a little to your watering can and go around when you're watering things and it feeds them. So this bed over here, we've got ladies mantle. And again, ladies mantle is a plant that grows in Shetland. It's by the roadsides and just about everywhere. And I would guess it's always been here. And again, it's another plant that's really great for dyeing. You can use the leaves and the flowers, which gives um, like a mustard kind of yellow. But if you use just the flowers, you get a beautiful bright yellow, which is great if you're wanting to over dye with indigo or woad. Uh, generally speaking, you would read in most natural dye books that you need 100% the weight of the wool to flowers but I don't personally work that way. I, I like to just harvest what I think the plant wants to give and then I dye bit by bit and so I'll get dark shades at the beginning when the vat's the strongest and it will slowly get paler and then I've got a whole range of shades of colour. I'm going to take some of these lower ones because they're, they're going to get eaten by the slugs anyway, I think. There we go. Pop them in the basket there. So we've got the ladies mantle and the alder leaves here, which is really exciting. It's like the magic bit of natural dyeing, thinking about how these amazing flowers are going to turn into colour on wool. And I've got here, this is the ladies mantle, so we're going to get those colours and these greeny colours from these flowers. So we'll pop them in the pot like magic, a bit of alchemy going on. I'm not using the leaves because I'm hoping to get really nice yellows and then over dye them with a bit of indigo or woad. Get that lovely green shade that you can get when you mix yellow and blue together. 
there. Okay, and then we got older leaves. And this is from my favourite tree in the garden. It produces these beautiful leaves. They can get really, really big towards middle of summer like now. Right, hopefully they're going to be full of pigment and we'll get some lovely shades from those. Okay, so we top the water up with this hot water. I'm just pouring it over the flowers. I always feel a bit sad now. I think those poor flowers suddenly get hot water all over them. But then I can say thank you to them for producing all the colours and pigment that I know they're going to bring. There we go. So now I'm going to heat them. Oh, one on there and one on there. And we have to just leave them to simmer now for about 45 minutes. And after 45 minutes, then their colour will have gone into the water. So this is the little room that I spend a lot of time in and I do a lot of the natural dye work in. Sorting the wool, winding it, skeining it, labelling it, posting it for customers. Um, but the most magical bit of all is when I have a chance like now to gather the colours together and actually look at the amazing palette of colours that nature can offer to us and all of these colours are from the dye garden. Um, so if we just have a quick look at this, this, these two here are from dock leaves which as most gardeners will know is usually disregarded and pulled up as a weed. Then some of these colours this side are from willow leaves. We've got madaroot and these, all these ones came from woad leaves which was last year's harvest because this year's hasn't um, got enough pigment just yet to have a deep blue. So these are now cooked flowers and you'll see how it's already changed into a beautiful colour. Try and use every drop of dye liquid that we can. Right, there we go. And then I'm just going to put the, the stuff that we've finished using in there and that'll go into the compost heap in the garden, ready to help nourish next year's. So this is the bit that's exciting, is getting the colour and actually seeing which plant it came from. And we're going to do the same thing now, but we're going to do it with the older leaves. Here we go. It looks a similar colour to the lady's mantle, just a bit paler, but actually it will give us a slightly different shade. It's got to the point now when I go for walks and around, I just, every time I see plants, I automatically think of what dye colour they're going to give. It really, wherever I am, I always see dye plants of some sort. Okay, so all of these trees down here are willow, and they're all different types of willow. They all came from, originally from Cope, and they were grown in Shetland, and they are all indigenous stock willows. So we've got leaves from each one will give a very slightly different shade of colour. This one probably is one of my favourites. It's an Aussie willow, and it, you can get a pink from the leaves and from the bark. Um, the bark can be used as a natural mordant. Okay, so down in this bit, we've got some really extraordinary plants that most people would always think of these as weeds. Um, and it's the stinging nettles. I'm not going to bend and touch them because I've got no gloves on. But these stinging nettles will give amazing shades of green, um, or gr greeny grey and green when you dye with them. And also they're amazing because they're healthy. You can make um, nettle soup and things from the seeds and you can actually make fibre from these. So these are stinging nettles which I don't strim or cut away because they're all used. 
again, this is the magic of dyeing. We're going to put in skeins of wool and I'm going to put in each pot a skein that's been mordanted with alum and I'm going to put a skein that's been mordanted with oxalic acid, which is the rhubarb leaf. These are going to go back on here to heat up. And then we have to leave those for, well, we wait till they simmer and then leave them for 45 minutes. There's some silverweed here. There's this bit growing long here and the leaves and then the roots will be spread all over the place. It never ceases to amaze me how it can grow on a sandy beach. There's not just sand and lack of soil, but you've got the salt because the tide can as you can see from the seaweed, the tide can come up this high and yet still it grows every single year. Um, and this is one of my favourite places to come and, and forage for dye plants because it's so peaceful and I can look at the sea, I can hear the sheep, which I really, really like hearing them in the distance. And I'll just sit on a rock and, I don't know, just be very quiet and still. So let's see what else can be found. I'm going to take some of the dock. This will make fine colour for the dye pot. Um, it's different dyeing with dock that's grown here on Booster Beach than it is from anywhere that's not right directly next to the sea or even from the garden. And the reason for that is it gets uh, salt sprayed on it and whatever is in the sea maybe it's not the salt it might be minerals but it affects the color that comes from the wood and i have often wondered if it acts like a, a different mordant or modifier something like that having the seawater kind of impregnated into it and i guess with the roots too because any moisture it's extracting from underneath the shingle is going to have those same minerals i, I would think from the sea it's going to be amazing when these seeds are ripe enough to harvest in September, October. You can just see them beginning to change colour just there and there. And they'll, they'll go like a deep, deep red colour. In fact, and this always intrigues me, the colours that the dock leaf begins to go towards middle of summer are the same colours that you get from the seeds and the same colours you can get on the wool from the seeds. Definitely in Shetland, because I've seen in the archives and as far as I know, elsewhere across the globe, people always used to use urine for a mordant. They didn't use other mordants very much. And um, the reason I'm telling you that here is because dogs will have peed around here. And I think that urine as well adds to the um, colours that you can get from, from this particular um, dock on this beach. Let's have a look. I can take loads of leaves from this one plant because, as you can see, it's been very prolific in foliage this year, which is cool. Right, that will do for a reasonable dye pot, I think, there. There we go. Um, and there's something I always do at the end of a, of a gathering, wherever I am, whether I'm by the water or I'm not by the water. I usually try and find a nice stone or a shell or something and I just throw it in the water to thank the environment for all that it gives. So I maybe like to just do that and see where we go. Let's have a look, see what I can find. I might stroll up this way to do that. Nice bit of white quartz there. Oh, and that one. There we go. Okay. Two different colours because we've used two different mordants. So I'm going to take the wool out. I already think this is magical because it's already started to show it can produce more than one colour. We've got the 
bright yellow and the kind of mustardy yellow. That one is the lady's mantle. And then this one, which is the alder leaves. Whoops, we've got three colours, but I can't get them all out at once, I don't think. There we go. There we go. So this is the older leaves. We've got bright yellow. I love that yellow from the older leaves. And then we've got the oxalic acid. And then this pale one, I'm hoping we can produce a really soft shades of a greeny grey. That's what the gold is here. So, Okay. Seeing this pink, which is from Madaroot, pinky orange, it just reminds me of when I very first started the natural dyeing and actually I was only six years old and my dad loved growing vegetables. Um, we had just a small garden but he particularly liked growing beetroots and mum would love to use the beetroots but she didn't like handling them because they stained her fingers so often I could do that job for her which was great for me at the age of six and I was always curious as to well, what happens to all that pink liquid when you cook them and, and the pan ends up with a pink pan of, of beautiful colour. So one day when mum was upstairs, I had a, a baby sister at this time and she had a cupboard full of nappies and I went in and I took one of her nappies out of the airing cupboard and I put it in the pan that she'd been cooking the beetroot in to see what would happen. And sure enough, it went pink, not orangey like this. It was a really nice pink, like what happens when you drop your beetroot on the tablecloth. I didn't know then as a child that it wouldn't stay, that that pink in beetroot is not light fast. But at the time, it was a very exciting experiment. I don't think mum was so pleased when she came down and saw the mess that I'd created. But that's what got me into the whole concept of natural dye at a very, very young age. Um, and it wasn't that long, maybe a couple of years, that Dad gave me a tiny bit of land in the garden that I could plant things in myself. So it was just fun, and it was a bit later in life that I very first had a garden of my own, not here in Shetland. And then I could really look into natural dye colours um, and experiment a bit more. And I got a book by a lady this was written, I think, in the 1970s, called Jill Goodwin, amazing book, and that taught you about what you grew in your garden and what colours it would give. So I just taught myself, and then when I got to Shetland 20 years ago, um, I hadn't realised quite how many sheep there are in Shetland, and so um, I became friends with several folk who were crofting families. And it wasn't long before I get a knock at the door or a call through the door, and I'd go along and they'd bring me fleece. And so I'd get an armful of sheep's fleece, usually full of peat, very messy and dirty, um, to see if I wanted it for spinning wool and dyeing. So of course I said yes every time. And the bath used to often be filled with, um, with sheep's fleece, getting all the grease and the lanolin out. And that's when I really, really got into dyeing wool with the natural dye colours and realised that wool takes up natural dyes probably more easily and more um, brighter than any of the vegetable fibres that you can get. I just can't stop. I keep telling myself maybe you've got enough wool, maybe you don't need to do any more and I keep going because I just love it so much. And to change the colour for this particular part we're going to use this very murky looking stuff, which is um, iron water. And iron water is made by putting rusty nails or bits of metal that I find perhaps on the beach, put them in the jar and add water and vinegar. And eventually you get this really grim kind of liquid. Um, I'll pour a bit in, it's ugh. <laughs> and it smells not very nice. And then this one, I've strained the liquid so it's a, a, a little bit clearer and I'm going to just give it a stir up. And we call this, in natural dyeing, call this a, a colour modifier. And we're going to try and change the colours of the wool to see what we can get. I'm going to pour the lady's mantle into here. Put that back on there. 
We'll do the same with the older leaf divert. Put some in here. So the key to doing this is to try and change the colour of the liquid the way that I'm hoping that it's going to go without adding too much of this because if I add too much we're going to get a really dark kind of murky black coloured wool and I, I really don't want that at this stage. <clears throat> so what I'm thinking of doing just to show how the colour change happens is I'm only going to recolour portions of the skeins of wool and then when we hold it up once it's coloured we'll be able to see the different shades that have happened. Now, I don't know if you can see inside the pan because you'll see the colour happening as hopefully the change. So I'm going to pour a bit of this in and it's going darker. Well hopefully that will be enough. We'll see. You can always add more. And then I'm going to do the same in this one. Okay. That's gone dark nice and quickly, which means it's probably going to make a good colour change and fairly fast. And with the older leaf, we've got this pale one, which is the, the wool with no mordant at all just coloured with the leaf and some tannin. <coughs> this is the alum and this is the oxalic acid. Okay. Okay. Right, fingers crossed, toes crossed, everything crossed for me. All right, here we go. Right, we're going to put it in just for a little while to start with. So now it's time to look at how I can actually dry some of the dye materials so that in the long winter months in Shetland I've still got stuff to do and I can still make beautiful colours and remember the sunshine. And there's some examples here of dried dye material. This one is willow bark, stripped off willow twigs and then dried and then it, it'll last all winter and to use it I just soak it for a few days beforehand in water to rehydrate it. Um, this is it chopped up because you have to use it chopped up like that. These are dock seeds which fall all over the place but give you those pinky colours that are really lovely on wool particularly in winter time um, and I've got plenty of those dried. Onion skins, um, they're something you can dye with all year round and onions grow really well in Shetland and you can get well, I've got up to 25 shades from onion skin, so they're quite magical as well. Um, that's a bit of magic for a dark winter's day. Then we've got chamomile, dyer's chamomile, um, marigold flowers, heather, which is one of my favourites, but unfortunately there's not much of it out just now. But heather will give a lovely range of shades from golds, greens, greys, and if you're lucky, you can get an orange but not every year. You can even dye the willow leaves. These are Aussie willows and they, um, there we go. they can dye wool a pinky colour. Um, I think there's some of that pinky colour just up here. I don't know if you can see that in there, just in there. Um, and what have we done here? These are older cones which give a deep dark grey shade which is really handy if you were looking for tonal contrast in fair isle knitting. They're a good kind of backup for the winter. Um, and then this one, now this is really interesting and it obviously it grows, but I couldn't show you that in the garden. This is rhubarb root. And when you actually dig a rhubarb up, this is bright orange under the ground. It's like a treasure in a cave or something because it almost glows under the ground. And you chop it up and dry it, which is what I've done here. And then when you rehydrate it, you can dye wool pinks, oranges, and a, if you're lucky again, and you use something called alkali extraction, you can sometimes get uh, like a burgundy red shade with rhubarb root. Um, but of course, the thing is when you dig it up, you have no more rhubarb plants, so you really need to grow them in rotation to be able to do that. 
And these dye stuffs and plenty of other dye stuffs, I, I try and harvest plenty in the summer um, so that I've got a lot for the winter. And then they're all stored a bit higgledy-piggledy, but up here. So, like, for instance, that box up there is full of dock seeds. And then that's willow bark. This is the Aussie willow twigs. Willow twigs, heather, onion skins. And then this bit over here is alder cones. Um, and there's some other flowers and things in the midst of that. Like, for instance, if you look at these ones, you'll see, you'll see a bit more of the quantities I'm talking about. Um, so this is corn marigold. And the thing to remember is, particularly with something like corn marigold, is that when they're dried, they seem to dye so much stronger in terms of colour, partly because of their lighter weight. So if you weigh them, they're not going to, you're going to get more flowers per gram than you would if they were fresh. But also something about the storage seems to, I don't know, it seems to enhance the, the shade of colour. So it's good to dry things, it's a good practice to get into, particularly when you've got plants all over the place and you don't want to just waste everything and it, you know it can all produce colour. It's magic, it feels like magic. I think it it probably touches the, the little girl in me. There's that something mysterious, magical, fantastical about a leaf or a, a seed or something making these beautiful colours. And actually that's something else that I didn't know until I came to Shetland and been here a little while, is the magic of putting colours together and creating Fair Isle knitting. I, I didn't know anything about uh, colour work or of knitting like that at all. I just knew about knitting in a straight colour. And I think that added to the magic and made me want to dye more and more colours so that people had more and more shades of wool that they could pick and choose from. So most of the excess iron has gone out of it now. It's been rinsed in water and then again it's been washed with um, like an eco-friendly washing up liquid which will be pH ne neutral because we don't want the acid or the alkaline to affect the colour of the wool. But what we need to do now is to use some vinegar. And we add the vinegar to the last rinse of water. And the reason for this is partly because it helps to remove any excess iron, but also because um, it softens the wool and we don't want it to get brittle and harsh from having been in the iron. Right. So it's got a good soak in the fibres of the vinegar water. I'm going to start to bring it out and bring these ones out first, I think. Here we go. This one's the lady's mantle. You can see now all the shades that we've been able to find. This is the alum mordanted and this is the oxalic acid, which is the rhubarb leaves. And then the bottom is the using the iron water and because we had those very bottom bits in longer they're darker modified shades than higher up towards the middle and it'll become more apparent once they're completely dry so the next stage is going to be to hang them out to drip dry this is the older leaves my favorite again <laughs> there we go and of course we've got three shades this time because we use three skeins. So we've got the alum mordanted which is the yellow and it's a really nice green there and once it's dry that's going to be more apparent that that's green. And you can actually see the difference between the darker bottom and the lighter middle of the green. And this one is one of my favourite shades which although it's grey and might seem a bit strange to anyone who does any form of fair isle knitting or colour work, that's why it's such a great plant because you can sometimes get really deep greys which you need for tonal change and you can get really light colour and light greys and that's the one with no mordant at all so that's quite a quick one to do and this is the one with the oxalic acid which from here where I am it's, it's got a nice, it's grey but it's got a very slight browny hue to it I don't know if you can see that, which would be, I think, quite lovely in some fair iron knitting. Right, there we go. So, those are all ready now to hang out on the washing line to dry.
This is the little sample cushion that I made a few years ago, actually, for a workshop I did at Wool Week. Um, and it was to show all the different colours that I can get from the dye garden in Shetland. And it's worked so well ever since then because people want to ask what colour comes from which plant and most of these have got woad involved somewhere, the blues and the greens. Um, so that shows the colours that I love. Um, and when I first started knitting with the naturally dyed wool here in Shetland, um, I didn't know how to knit with colour work or fair isle, so I was actually dyeing wool so that it was, it was dip dyed and it came out in all different shades, so I could actually get a variegation as I was knitting without having to think about when or where or how I would change colour. My favourite colours are ones that use woad, over dyed, over woad onto the Shetland dye plants and I think these might have actually been the very first um, fair hour work that I attempted and um, so I wanted to use the colours of, of the woad dyed wool and then trying to get things that contrasted. For the uh, 2019 I was going to do some workshops and I thought it would be really good if I could try and design one of these Piri pouches specially for that particular uh, Shetland Wool Week. And so that this was designed for Shetland Wool Week and the um, colours all from the garden. I don't know, I really enjoyed doing this one and I still enjoy knitting these, which I do from time to time because they're just a fun thing to do and it always reminds me of being out in my dye garden. And I really don't knit so much in the summer because I'm always out there dyeing or harvesting. But the winter, it's, it's just a fine thing to be with the wolves and have them amongst me, even like I'm sitting here now and looking at the colours and remembering in the dark, dark months just what it's like out there in the summer and, and what the colours are like. I really like that feeling. 